It's good to have you here, sir. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Nova Scotia. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Happy to be back in Toronto. I was here last week. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, the moment we've been waiting for, uh, just to have the fireside chat, and also to have an opportunity to ask a few questions from my guest this evening. One of the reasons we usually have a fireside chat at Friends of Africa and some of our summits is one, on one hand, to provide insights, clarity on burning issues. Um, the other part, also, of course, uh, some of you have come with some of your questions. We're not going to, we're not definitely not going to be able to take uh, all your questions because of time. But we do have other ecosystem partners in the room too, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, Nerissa Allen uh, from Vancouver, BC and uh, our friend Christelle Fransoy, who, who is also here with us, um, Table of Impact practitioners, and we have a couple of other people in the room. You can easily ask them questions. So I'm going to do the honors tonight first by trying and attempting to introduce Dr. Rostam Saltwell, uh, and then I'm going to have him say a few words about himself. I, I've got to do it that way, um, because a lot of them don't know you yet. <laughs> All right, so uh, Dr. Southwell is best known as the founding CEO of the Black Business Initiative um, and is originally from St. Kitts. He arrived in Halifax in 1972 and has been contributing to Nova Scotia's business development since he arrived. Um, Dr. Southwell has, as you can imagine, his chancellor, and so you can imagine the leadership qualities, the, 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 the value he brings to the table, um, having served across vertical industry sectors over the years. BBI is said to have created 1,500 jobs and has provided business training to over 1,000 aspiring entrepreneurs over the years. Recently, Mr. Dr. Southwell, uh, Dr. Southwell, led the organization BBI into its next phase of growth by expanding across the Atlantic provinces. In addition to his business excellence, Dr. Southwell has demonstrated his commitment to the community and has served as co-chair of the African Heritage Month Committee and serves currently on several boards, including the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, the Waterfront Development Corporation, um, now called Develop Nova Scotia the United Way Halifax, and several others. In June 2023, Dr. Southwell was appointed the Chancellor of Dalhousie University as the ninth Chancellor of that university. Ladies and gentlemen, again, join me to provide a warm welcome to Dr. Southwell. Thank you for joining us. So a few minutes uh, to share maybe a few other tips of how you got here, about how you got here. Thank you. Well, I'll probably just Say good afternoon again. Thank uh, CASA and Friends of Africa for inviting me here. And I don't know that person that you read about, so <laughs> I don't know if we'll jump in. But um, you know, in all, um, coming from a small island state in the Caribbean um, some 50 plus years ago, and going through the black community in, in Nova Scotia, and in fact, uh, somehow getting into the economic piece and the community economic development piece, it has been a rewarding experience to know the precocious young man, um, given the right tools and the right opportunity, can do for a country and for marginalized people. And so for me, um, living that type of life won't bore you with the challenges and ups and downs. It happens to all of us. But for me, doing that was important. The chancellor stuff was a bit of a surprise because I was in New York at the, at the UN uh, with the Decade Forum and had this call for Dalhousie. And I thought I was being asked to come on yet another board. <laughs> so when he said chancellor, I was completely shocked. And you don't realize people are noticing the impact you're having. So very grateful for eminent university over 200 years to have invite a black male who is not um, from historically, I mean, I'm an immigrant uh, to that role, took some courage, inspiration, and innovation. So I'm, I'm pleased, I'm pleased to have done that. I've done a lot of other things. And uh, in the interest of time, I, you can Google or read about those or catch me in the corner. <laughs> 
right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rossman. Um, today, we're going to um, answer a few questions. Yeah, you are, um, if you were in the academic sector, we would call you uh, an emeritus professor, uh, <laughs> a veteran in the field, from the field. And so you've done a lot of work uh, as it relates to the development of black businesses, development of community generally, and you serve on a lot of boards. In recent times, uh, 2021 specifically, the federal government of Canada started or uh, introduced and launched the program called the Black Entrepreneurship Program, the BEP. A lot of the black BIPOC members of uh, community members have benefited from this program in terms of training. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, some of them will be showcased and featured this evening. However, a lot of questions remain. Uh, most of us understand the full um, features of the Black Entrepreneurship Program. It's in three tranches, the Black Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, part of it Wendy alluded to when she was making her speech here earlier on, the Black Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, the Black Entrepreneurship National Ecosystem Fund, and then the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund, which is administered by FACE. Um, as a matter of fact, Dr. Southwell is also a member of the board of FACE, so uh, make sure you reach out to him once he gets off the stage. The questions remain, and some of those questions are, what exactly is the impact, or what's the impact been like on the lives of businesses within the black community? How many people are really benefiting from this? As a matter of fact, some of the ambassadors came into the VIP room, the green room, earlier on this morning, and as we were articulating to them the benefits, the huge benefits inherent in being part of the black ecosystem, you know, um, tapping into the loan opportunity, collaborating with other people to create partnerships and other businesses, the ambassador said to me, how many people have this really touched? How many people have been impacted? What's going on? And of course, please bear in mind, I am actually one of the ecosystem partners too, meaning Castle Foundation. But I know we've done a lot. And I know that I have colleagues here, fellow CEOs that have done a lot. But people don't appear to know. What, the question then is, what can we do? How do you think, uh, first, are we the strategy to administer the program? Is it the correct strategy? Is it being done the right way? Second question, how can we do this so that other people become more aware of the solutions we bring to the table as black ecosystem partners. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so that's really easy for me because if you, anyone in the world right now, can show me a better way for delivering those things, then I would look at it. Yeah. The thing is that the BBI um, on its own, outside of this, we've been doing this since 1996 with a lot less money and tremendous success. There are guys I speak often, and I say the top companies in Nova Scotia, a small province in Canada, over the life of BBI, the top black companies have done over a billion dollars in sales. And so guys straighten up. Then I tell them about the job growth, the amount of entrepreneurs, the hundreds of entrepreneurs, and the youth who are doing great work. So we have no no qualms in saying that the FACE strategy, which is based on what the work BBI has done, is going to work. Obviously, you need, um, you need discipline and you need commitment on both sides. So you need it from the entrepreneurs who are coming in. Not everybody is a business person, and we have to stop telling black people, you get some money, you go into business. You need business skills, you need a business strategy. And you need capable management to deliver those services. My colleagues at FACE didn't always listen to me during the negotiations. In fact, sometimes um, Chiselle is laughing. Sometimes what I was suggesting was um, diluted. But the thing is, we had spent 25 years doing it for black people in the same target market. And we had learned a lot about our community. And so we, were, we turned over the playbook, every ounce of it, every sentence, every comma, to them so they can modify a strategy where we had made mistakes and learned from it. I believe that even to this day, they would say, Rustin was right in cases where they weren't listened. And they've celebrated other times. 
every situation, and Jeff Bezos um, has said this in the past, everything that small. Because of the BBI, the face had more currency than other organizations coming in, but they still hadn't had the experience. And so there were mistakes made. But I think the guy who was speaking about the car mm -hmm. in Ghana, yeah. he's telling you the same thing. Like the Japanese made a lot of mistakes before they got, got to Lexus. Right. So we are black people, expect that. But let us be respectful to the folks and give them an opportunity. So I, th I, I you know, the question is, um, would you do anything different? Now I'm one of these people, I, I hate to hear people say, I would never do anything different. Of course, you know, we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. So you will change where you have to change. But with the knowledge that you have, I remind some of my friends that the shoe that you wear 200 years ago, it didn't matter which foot you had it on, right? So there was a lot of bruising if you put the wrong foot in the wrong shoe. Now the shoes are customized. Some of them can even give you ratings and all those comforts. So it takes time to do those things. And so face should, have, should be given the opportunity. They've gotten out more funding than they anticipated. They're reaching more people. My own belief is that aftercare ecosystem support is, in the, is, very, is more important than the money in the success of this. I keep saying that um, a lot of people in our community is money, 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 money. You know, we need more money. Money is the problem. But the problem is not money. The problem is having a, a business case, seeing an opportunity of growth, and a good team to deliver on that. I mean, that's the problem. I have seen companies who got 10,000 end up at a million dollars, and uh, companies that got a million end up at 10,000, you know, for those cases. And so we have to be aware of that. I believe that, um, and I give Tiffany and the team time, um, and I should actually, you know, full transparency, I'm currently the vice chair of FACE. <laughs> um, but we do have candid, uh, trusted conversation and then the thinking around the table is that it's not a group thing. I think Wendy, who was here earlier, yeah. she's also on the board. We, okay. we try to bring thoughts in. I know this, I know you have all questions, but if you want to give me question two, yeah. I can jump on that if I have not covered it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Southwell. Thank you so much for, for answering that. Uh, yeah, we, uh, and I must mention that we, th these were questions we got from different constituents from programs and so on. So we just did a full collation of this. Now, uh, the, the question then even is, there are about two more before we, we open it up to the, to the floor. Um, not everybody needs a loan anyway. <laughs> Like you just said, not everybody is an entrepreneur, so not everybody needs a loan. And I think that was why uh, this type of question came up to say, could there be any other sort of resources that people could actually access outside of the loan fund that would help them kind of structure their businesses or perhaps put them in a better, uh, a better state? Uh, to begin to run the business, to scale the business, perhaps some partnership, what exactly and how can the group help businesses to be pro structured in that way? Because not everybody will manage a loan well. Perhaps maybe if they had business shadowing, I'm not sure, uh, would that work? And would that be something that FACE could offer? Thank you. Great, great question. And for me, I get that a lot. Um, just so most people know, BBI was bordered, bordered in Nova Scotia. That means that our services, especially financial services, was just in that province. We're now doing the entire Atlantic. But I've always got calls from right across the country. And that's the type of question we get. In fact, I was speaking with Gabrielle, uh, who, is a, who is an up and coming uh, film producer right here, um, originally from Ghana, that he's doing this project. And he was talking about different ways. And he was speaking about exactly that. Here's the thing. The government announces um, phase. It's about a hundred or two hundred million dollars, and everybody beat up on the phase team, right? We are missing the point. Outside of that, there's hundreds of billions of dollars that's not going to the community. 
right? So if you're looking at this small portion over here, as yours, I'm black, I don't need to have any um, criteria to get to that money. You're missing the point that there are billions of dollars that's granted to white organizations and other organizations that we're not capturing. So it's important that the organizations who are doing this kind of work understand the government relations and understand where those sources are. And I hope you don't mind me mentioning your name, um, Gabriel, because I just met him. But the first thing I was asking, what about um, tax credits for film board in, in Ontario? What about this? What about that? There is funding out there for trusted and tested organizations with a good strategy, irregardless of what color you are. And so the organization that supporting you should be also able to point you to the bigger amount because the amount that's given to face is probably 0. 0.0000 of 1% of the entire budget. And we need to be in the 100%. And we need uh, capable organizations in the ecosystem and others to provide that information to entrepreneurs and people who need help. Otherwise, we're not doing them a service. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for those insights. Thank you. Um, now, the, this last question, at least for now, uh, before we open it up to the floor, um, has to do with um, barriers. I mean, of course, we know the story, so we're not going to go into all of that. Uh, but the question then is, uh, should we be facing systemic barriers? in uh, access or in our quest to secure loans, just as we face with the general banks. And I must provide some more context. Uh, now, the group that sent this particular question alluded to the fact that if you go into the general financial sector, that's the last question, if you, if you go into the general financial sector, for instance, uh, the way that loans are reviewed, your request, your application for loans is completely different uh, from people who have been here for donkey years or we're immigrants, we're newcomers, we're starting businesses because we've always run businesses where we're coming from. And so you come into town believing that you have the expertise, you have the competence, you have the skill to run your own business and then you approach a bank. And then you are subjected to the same metrics. And so now that we, uh, we have our own money, like you said, like in quotes, our own money, why should we be subjected to the same metrics? Of course, I do know why, but then they want you to answer that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not going to have a right answer for, for this. I, um, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, uh, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. The courage to continue, that counts. And I start there because I believe that our efforts irregardless of the hoops, we have to be able to, um, to overcome those. So that if, you, if I understand the question right, there's the issues of um, racism or racial prejudice or marginalization of the clients in front of you. There's the issues of fairness in terms of the process and strategy. And then honestly, there's the issue of, of, of capacity because I don't believe that um, whether it's Nerissa or, or Face or anyone should be investing in any company, regardless of the color, if they don't think that the person is gonna get any returns. I mean, you're not in business to get grants or get money from people. The sole reason you go into business is to create a product or service and sell it for a profit. If that's not happening, then, you know, it doesn't matter what the policy is. I was in the discussions when FACE was created, and yes, there's some crazy people around the thing who doesn't understand the cultural necessities of the lending package they were designing. If you recall, the banks were all at the table, and each of them came in with a plethora of ideas, and each of them went out, and they stole a lot of the things they heard, and try to create that strategy. And we know that, I think the Global Mail article that's just came out, there was only one banker who was readily given their sats, right? So we know those things are in place. We can either decide we will overcome them because we are people who have gone through struggle, or we actually have to have strategic decisions to do that. 
one of the things is everybody know Martin Luther King and all the guys who've been in the struggle. They shut the Montgomery with the bus strike. So you don't have to put your money in institutions that's not helping us. I mean, they actually can feel that response. The other thing is, I mean, on our side too, and I can say this honestly, because when BBI first started out, uh, Business Development Bank sent a chap over to us, which a black organization has sent to, uh, to the FDBD at the time. It's BDC now, the Business Development Bank. He sent that guy over with a handwritten business plan with a pencil sketching of those things in front of her and our officer. And that guy came to me and said, Russ, this is the quality of the stuff you're doing, which I know because there were some strong business owners that, they, that there was capable folks in place. And he should not have sent that young man in front of us. He wasn't ready for it. He wasn't prepared. And the documentation was an embarrassment. So we have to have a real view when we see guys who are trying their best to help their families and support their families and their lives and want to get in business, we don't make it further complicated to them and send them in front of folks ill-prepared. That is our duty. That is what this funding is to do with build capacity. So some of it is on our side. Some of it is on their side. We can create the change, but we have to have deep con conversations of to what it is. So I have no problem when we turn someone down and when BBI started, the first thing they'll do is pick up the phone and call the premier of the province. I went to BBI for the black money and they didn't get a loan. And, you know, they'll call the chair of the board and the chair of the board has said, I don't work for BBI, call the office, right? The, the, the thinking on that is that we also are accountable for what we are creating. And you don't want these guys to borrow money and then they're in debt and you have to go to collections and all those things. So it's, you know, it's a ticklish piece and on both sides. And yes, there's a lot of scary people was in that room, when, you know, from the banking institution and the terms and so on. But we held them. I mean, I, I, you know, it wasn't only me in the room, the, but a lot of us held them to task when we thought they were um, out of line. And we will see a better project if we work together and believe that we can have entrepreneurs like Ross Simmons, who is now, I knew him when he was a 12 year old. He's one of the top content creators of black companies in the world. You know, um, Dr. Leo Jones, who was in our businesses jamming youth program. I also knew her as a teenager. She's now the Dean of Black Health for Dal Med School. There's a kids at Hope Blooms who are manufacturing their own dressing company and has, um, been in soapies and superstore and so on. If we only believe in that hope and give them the opportunity and the proper tools and the support, and we have to be honest. If you're not a good business person, we don't want the customers to tell you that. The person you're in front of should tell you, hey, you need help. This is what you need to do. Put the support system in place. Come back when you're ready. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Southwell. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, and I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to turn, the, you know, turn it over to you now um, if you do have questions. But I think this has been clearly articulated, succinctly said. Not everyone is a business person. Nine to five jobs are there. You can also run a nine to five shop and still run a business also simultaneously. Uh, but I usually tell a lot of people who come into the Black Advisory Hub, which we manage on behalf of the federal government too, that, you know, where most of us came from, you actually continue the work after five o'clock. Uh, we're not known to go to bed. We actually run the business, whether from your basement, whether from home, from the trunk of your car, you're selling cakes or baking stuff and so on, and you're distributing that. And so it's important that we know what we're cut out to do before we start taking a loan. We've also had some misconceptions that I must quickly drop, um, you know, just mentioned, when people said, oh, it's our black money. Uh, and so oh, I can't be left out. Everybody's taking it. So that those are the clarifications that have been provided tonight that, yes, indeed, it's for the black community, BIPOC community, but it's not for the taking. 
just because it's there. And that's why it's important to have a session like this. And so if we do have um, some other inputs from some of my colleagues also, that would be helpful. But I see a lot of questions there. Uh, Professor Odoi, yes, I know that Professor Odoi teaches a lot of uh, the sessions at uh, the Black Advisory Hub. So please, yeah, your question. Thank you. I just wanted to say that a lot of the time when you go to events like this, you know, um, like Doctor said, it's not all the time that you need money as a business person to carry your business. Maybe the networking, like how we are here, Friends of Africa, you talk to people around you, you might see that the person that has the money is actually sitting near you. Talk to people. There are people who want to invest money and they are sitting around you. They want to partner in your business to make it grow. So that's the first thing, to get money. Number two, is the fact that when the phase coalition was put in place, we're all cited, business consultants like us were cited. Um, initially, uh, we thought that the information was not out there. Then Casa Foundation took on the, the battle, started um, putting things together through the Black Advisory Hub, which I teach there. And we're trying to, we help um, you know, students to do business plans and everything, right? But one of the things that we found, um, Doctor, the question is that one of the things that we found is that we realized that most black people Unfortunately, we have issues with our credit. And so um, we were, to our understanding, we thought that, you know, the banks, you know, right now when we currently go to the bank, because about 80% of black people, I mean, here in Canada, have issues with their credit. And therefore, we don't have, have access to the um, to funding. So one of the things that I'm thinking that we need to do first is to educate and help black people come out of these credit issues, maybe if there's some small funding there to help them come out of it, maybe financial counseling, financial advisory, to help them come out of that before actually coming to apply to the FACE coalition. Because you guys have the responsibility to also ensure that these loans that they come for, they pay back. A lot of the time, students come to my, or business people come to my office, we help them develop business plans, but then when they go submit to FACE coalition, they come back and issue, most of the time, has to do with their credit. So I wanted to see your take on that. Thank you. Yeah. And Hey, I'm not going to run away from that one. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the things um, with the, the BBI model, what we did, we created the lending by a blanket guarantee, and we were only using Royal Bank, right? So we knew that um, the issue of improper use of loan funds and not being accustomed and disciplined and all of those things would come up. And we approved the loans, and because of the blanket guarantee, there wasn't like in the phase system, BDC, Saba do the, um, the adjudication of the testing over again, sort of. In our case, if we said to fund it, it got funded. We still had failure. I mean, it's natural. Black people don't have to feel guilty. White people do default as well, and other people do. But we had a higher success because of it, because of the fact that um, we had a team of um, entrepreneurship engagement managers that provided support. Yeah, if you were defaulting a loan, we encourage you to talk to us before just running away and not paying. You see, BBI was founded, before BBI, there was a funding for the Africa Nova Scotia in the Preston. And the thing that they did incorrectly, they were lending Giselle and then they were granting you. So you didn't have to pay. So then Giselle, Giselle would, wouldn't pay. So no one was paying. And in a year, all the money the government gave them was gone. And so in order to sustain the funds, when BBI did that, we were lending the bank's money. And in five years, our funding had grown to the chagrin of the, of the bureaucrats. And then they changed the rules on us because we had invested the money and folks were paying back and we were making interest and the money that we were using was an investment tool. So we were also growing on that front as well. But yeah, in order to rehabilitate credit, um, the system that we're using right now does push everyone in a kind of mainstream type of thinking. And that can be done with um, supports and, and customization. That would be the only thing that I would say on that. Um, we still have a lot of work to do 
with providing counseling and guys because in, you know I've known relatives and so on who believe that um, you borrowed a loan but somehow they hear give so you you need to get the guys to understand there's a difference and in doing business you want to protect your company as well so very good point you know and that's the situation thank you, um, thank you again uh, um, the lady yeah please go on if you can make it short, so good morning, we can make two more. Oh, yeah. thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, everyone. <laughs> Miss Natasha here. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very blessed. I'd like to know, Dr. Southwell, how do you navigate hope? <laughs> I knew you would ask me a question like that when, you, when I saw your hat. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. That's an emotional one for me. Because, um, you know, the house, my dad was a politician, but fought the colonial, um, the colonial British and, and in the Eastern Caribbean, um, worked in the sugar factory, uh, sub subsidized them for many years. And he instilled in us, his, his children, that there's only one way to do things, which is the right way. And he gave us um, sufficient of a direction that we're here socially for mankind and to imp improve that. And the type of work that we do, and uh, not only me and myself, the others who have, you know, you feel the kind of angst when the government say we have a couple million dollars and guys can't get the money. And so you, 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 feel, you do sometimes wonder and feel hopeless. So for me, it was to keep my eyes on, on, the, on, the, on the staff and the, and the policy and continue to that. He was 31 years old during World War II, and my, his second son had just been born two days before. And he took pen to paper and wrote a poem called Take Up the Black Man's Burden. And that poem took through all of the struggles of black people over the years to get where they were. And it was only a few years ago when I realized that poem was in response to Rudyard Kipling's 1899 poem, which said, take up the white man burden, except that Kipling was talking about how white organizations and countries were protecting black people and Chinese people and so, so their size of burden. And that is said, no, it is about the leadership of um, Marcus Garvey, Henri Christophe, and others. Out of that life, he, he passed away after a conference in the Eastern Caribbean, which created the organization of Eastern Caribbean States. And he signed that document on the Friday. And then he died. And that changed my life. And I always felt from that time that if I'm going to do anything with my life, is to create hope and potential for any person who come to me and ask. I speak to guys in British Columbia, um, folks here today, even the conversation we're having at the table. I've always given to folks. It hasn't been for me. I'm not personally wealthy. But you know, with um, Chancellor Dalhousie ain't bad either. You know, even though there's some money. Um, several honorary doctorates. But I never did it for that. I did it because I think that we can and, and we must do these things. Thanks for that question. All right. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to... I see two hands. Uh, very short. Yes, let, let's give him the mic. And then the lady over there. I think uh, we don't have anybody from this side. So we'll yeah. take those two. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. I think you are saying that uh, even though you're not financially worth rich, but you're knowledgeable or rich. You're very intelligent and I admire your gift. One thing I just want to say is that if you look at the Chinese community, the Indian community, and the other group of uh, people, how they work cordially, as a team and support one another. 
But when we come to the black community, it's different. I live in Brampton, and I know how the Indians operate. And be there helping one another to reach up there. But when it gets to our side, it's different altogether, which is deep that you can't talk much. But the question I'm asking is, how can a young black businessman who just started his business and the business is less than one year and the ideas and the things that he is bringing on board is great for the future trying to get a loan and the first question or one of the question is we want a financial report two years financial report where is he going to get it his business just started less than a year and he has a great vision and you can see that this guy needed help and when the question is say if you don't have two years financial report i'm sorry we can help you now in this situation if you say the money is there for the black community young entrepreneurs how can such person be helped when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change i believe um I believe one of the challenges that folks have is, is exactly that. Um, and to my friend in the hat to ask the question of hope, is not, to me, is not any um, strange reasoning other than some kind of uh, divine intervention why Gabriel sat at the same table and pulled out his stuff and he actually literally pitched me on, on his project there, right? But I'm not sure that every time a young black woman or a young black man does that, we have either a receptive body on the other side or someone who is willing to give. And I believe that the ecosystem should provide a lot more sources of doing that. Um, let me uh, give you an example. Um, there is a, a company in Nova Scotia right now who he was struggling to find himself and do what he wanted. On a $10,000 loan, he created a, a painting company, $10,000. He created a painting company. And then he had the call a few years later to bid on the city line striping the streets, you know, in the middle of the streets and the different lines. A lot of people, white and black, said, Glenn must be crazy, <laughs> you know. There's no way he's going to get that contract. And working with the, with the right folks, he decided that he would buy some lights, some big floodlights, and he paint the streets and stuff at night. Take a few seconds. He doesn't need a lot of people to divert the traffic and all those things to get that done. So he does it quicker, made some money. So one of the things is, is speaking to our folks about innovation, providing them the mentorship and support to help them through those times. You're not going to get all of them, unfortunately, but you, sh you should be able to capture most of them. So when they're up against those challenges, is there to the, to the question, on hope and aligning it with you, with how does a young person like that get, cut, get that? We need to provide uh, capable mentorship positions. That is one of the big things that I had with face because when I said you need entrepreneurship engagement managers, I think they were calling them ELOs or something like that, right? You see, these guys aren't loan officers. They're actually the mindset, the shoulder, the capacity person on those. I think they've since changed that. But the idea was if we're going to be out there telling our people what to do in business, then we better know what it is, and we better be able to provide them every support along the way so that when you invest in them, they have the most chances to survive. And, you know, I feel that. And I want to thank you for that question, because if we're getting into entrepreneurship development, we must understand that we're not... We're not only behind because of capital, we behind also because of capacity. Then my goodness, we can fix the capacity because you shouldn't need a lot of money to do that. And put the best people in front of our entrepreneurs. And don't give them crazy business plans 
to send to that and embarrass our community. So that's the point. And thanks for that question. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Last question. The lady. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Louisa Boachi Freeman, and I work for RBC Royal Bank. I'm a senior relationship manager for business market. So before my question, just to uh, answer or say something to the question that you did ask, um, if you're starting a business and you don't have that experience, there's something called startup programs, which you can access through the government website as well. It's called the Canadian Small Banking Financing Loan. You don't need to be two years into your business before you do that. You need projections, you need uh, business, um, you need business plan, projections, and all of that sort. So I think that information is very important. We lack information and we lack a lot of knowledge depending on the industry that maybe you want to work in or get financing from. But my question to you, uh, doctor, is that, um, so when the RBC, when the Black Entrepreneur Business Program came, I was one of the champions in my region in, in, in Brampton to champion for this program. But I found it very, very difficult that at one point I had to <laughs> take a step back and ask what is really the point of this program? Why? Because um, it is for the marginalized community. And we know that as Mr. O'Doy uh, said, we, most of us our credits are bruised, right? So if we're asking for credit, for this program, then we're in trouble. And then if it channels through RBC, we're asking for guarantee. But we don't have the guarantee either. And we don't have the capital either. So that's why we thought that the program was there to ease that tension so black, the black community can access this pool and um, start doing their businesses. But we're not able to access it fully because credit is a hindrance capital is a hindrance, information is a hindrance. So what can you really do or what would be the best way to simplify uh, the requirements for this program so that it will be accessible to those that are really wanting to access and do business? Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I, obviously there's no right answer when you do these things. Let me, let me tell you that um, BBI is working with your bank, with Royal Bank. That's the bank that we've worked in. But you know what? It wasn't the first. The first bank that we went to was carrying our clients through hell. <laughs> like literally, even though with a blanket guarantee, we pulled out from them and told them, we don't need you to do that anymore after a year or two. And that's when we landed with, um, with RBC. And the, the thing is, like racism, racism is there. And what was happening, even though we had the blanket guarantee, the black person would go in to the bank and the bank would treat them the same way. We didn't see change. And at 12.01, past the 60 days or 90 days, they were yanking on the guarantee. And we said, no, if our people are supposed to be successful business owners, you, use, you need to treat them like your million dollar clients, not your 10 or $15,000. And they refused, and we moved, we went to RBC. And RBC, for the, so RBC isn't totally without fault, but at the time, they were very innovative and supporting. The, the clients were happy um, when, when they were getting close to default, instead of waiting to day 31, they would call them before, and people were rehabilitating their credit. That is the suggestion we had gone in with when the face was being designed. And you know, for one reason or another, you get to run in the flow charts and so on. There are pieces of it that didn't match that particular model, right? And let's be, let's be honest too. RBC was working from us at a blanket guarantee. So they know that there's nothing to lose. The previous bank was working on the same thing, but as soon as the guy was 10 minutes over, it was gone. And so they were willing to help. So you, you need that engagement 
from the from the chartered banks to help that. And that's why I think somebody was speaking earlier on about their numbers not matching up. That's why when they design their own program, they don't want to give the numbers anymore because they're not seeing anything different because they're not doing anything substantively different, right? They call it a black program, but they're doing the same thing and expecting, um, expecting changes. So I believe the full jury isn't out. I believe there, there was a lot of progressives so I don't want to bash all of the guys. There are a lot of progressives around the table. There are some people who are surprised. And I believe to the question of hope, there is hope. But we as a black community have to be vigilant. We want to be just as hard as the bank as, and as hard on those in our community who are doing things that are putting us in those positions. So I, I, agree, I agree with you um, very much. I think that's a, a key piece of what we need to see happen. And I, you know, I'm, like I'm on the face board. I think there's still work to be done, but in the long run, we, we will have a project that's now using the money and investing it so that it's sustainable for the children of our future. And thank you for the question. Thank you, thank you again, and I'm so sorry. We, we really can't take any more questions. We're really sure running out of time because of the other events, and we, we just have like less than an hour to go in this room. So ladies and gentlemen, I would say that um, as, as some of you might know, the BEP program, three tranches, the BNF, uh, 50 million fund for training, business plans like Odo shared, and then the main one is a 128 million plus maybe 30 million, a total of 150 million dollars provided by the federal government of Canada to face coalition in total with BDC and the government itself contributing for you for the loans. But 25% 250, I mean 25,000 and 250,000. You can take from 25,000. And the max is two fifty thousand, if I'm correct. And so you can you can check the face coalition um, the website and get all the details as many as many details as you require. Not everybody needs a loan, like he's rightly said. Competency skills required, but consultation can be done. You can reach out to the thirty um, organize I mean, the thirty organizations that started with the responsibility of supporting you with the preparation of your business plan, structure, make sure you have the requisite, you meet the requirements before you approach phase. But the challenges are there, as we have received all the comments, the challenges are definitely there, but uh, they are not insurmountable. That's what I hear from Dr. Southwell tonight. And we keep at it, we keep at it. If you don't get it this season, you might get it if you do a few other things the next time. So don't give up, and that's the message. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I just add, one, one of the things that you have to realize too, like in the last few years, we negotiated some really robust stuff um, with the government. And I believe that we'll be remiss if we only look at the the phase coalition and the, the black entrepreneurship program of roughly 100 to 200 million dollars the supporting black communities initiative that we are part of you know we've distributed um, close to 70 or 80 million dollars casa is a beneficiary yeah. with um, tropicana right. to open 900 black not-for-profit organizations um, um, Mutual Radio in the back yes. is a beneficiary as Absolutely. well. Yeah. And that's making significant um, impact in black communities. And the philanthropic fund, which is another $200 million. So there's a lot of funding, and I believe that the agencies who are involved should be providing information to the guys in the grassroots, mm. because you are our champions. I mean, there's no point. We get in the information, we're not sharing it. Mm. I mean. I can come out here and help you guys if you need it. <laughs> Thank you again for, for those comments. Uh, Dr. Southwell will be around. He's still around. So uh, I don't expect that you go sit at his table right now because we're still here. But then, of course, uh, there will be time for um, last tea break and then some dinner will still be served tonight. So uh, please feel free to connect with him. Uh, keep in mind, again, I'd mentioned to you, Nerissa Allen is in the room, President, CEO, BBI, um, Vancouver. Uh, yeah. 
BBC Vancouver, sorry. And then um, you have uh, Christian Francois, uh, the Social Finance Fund. Uh, that's a table of impact, $750 million. They are all in the room with you tonight. That's why we bring them. So make sure you sit with them at some point and connect with them. You know, uh, It's important we have the information. And keep in mind again that the other fund that he mentioned, they are grants. So this one is the loan, but the one we benefited from, a grant. The one he benefited from, which radio, a grant. So we're all here. You can connect. You can ask questions. And this will be helpful to us all. Tonight, again, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give a round of applause to Dr. Southwell, the ninth, the ninth chancellor of Dalhousie University, 200-year-old. And I think he's the first black chancellor of that university in 200 years in Canada. Thank you so much again for gracing our stage. We really appreciate your coming. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.